when you thought Bakugo was about to go down the Sasuke route, but then you were instantly proven wrong. Yeah, that happened. So I quickly just want to apologize for all of you out there that have been patiently waiting for me to upload this My Hero Academia video. A lot of things happened yesterday when my dad, he, he, let's just say he went through a lot of issues. It was a stressful day, and I preferably rather not get into too much context, but it, it, it was stressful. And so I just was not mentally there to make videos yesterday, and I finally just got around to watching the episode like an hour ago. So just please forgive me for the delay, and I'm sorry you guys had to wait for this My Hero Academia video and also Darling in the Franks, which will be out later. But anyways, pushing that away for now, let's get into this episode of My Hero Academia. Bakugo is a heavily debated topic for this week's episode, and I think the entire anime-only community was probably talking about the fact that Bakugo might pull a Sasuke. I remember when we got to this point in the manga series that many manga readers were saying, oh no, Horikoshi is pulling, you know, a Naruto chasing after Sasuke type thing going on with the series. It's trying to copy Naruto. That's what many were saying when the story got to this point. And in a lot of ways, I can understand the parallels and the comparisons between the two series. I mean, Bakugo has always been this character that's kind of like someone that doesn't seem to follow the rules properly. He's very aggressive. And I mean, he's also the rival type dude that is with Izuku. So I mean, when you look at his character, he does have those sasuke -like like traits. You could see it. And so because of that, many assumed that, you know, Bakugo might turn into a villain, go complete evil, and just, you know, go against UA and everybody, and he would fall, uh, be become a fallen character. For instance, he would be a villain. And obviously from this episode, that is not the case. And the reason why it's not the case is because of character development and being consistent with your writing. That is what I mainly want to talk about when it comes to this week's episode of My Hero Academia. Consistent character development with Bakugo is what caused us not to have a Sasuke situation. You see, in the previous season, when we got to really see the difference between Izuku and Bakugo and how they are as heroes, we got to see how they view All Might. For instance, Izuku is someone that has this trait to where he always needs to save someone. Anyone that's in front of him, he needs to rush after them and save them. That's how he's always been. And Bakugo is someone that wanted to be like All Might in the terms of he wants to be able to take on any challenge. For instance, if it's a 1v5, he does not care. He wants to stand up like All Might and still win in the end. He's kind of like more of strength based than Izuku. Izuku's more about just wanting to save people. And when you see these two comparisons obviously they're different. And if you know Bakugo's characterization because of that, wanting to stand up no matter the odds it was a big part at the end of the episode when he stood up against Shigaraki and everybody else in the League of Villains. He's like, you know, I want to pull an All Might. All Might's my inspiration and all that. I want to fight you. And that is a moment I truly appreciate. And I think many can agree the reason why that scene is so good is because it stuck true to Bakugo's character. Even though he seems like he could easily be a villain, and I even was talking about this when I first started reviewing the manga. I'm not, I'm not even joking. When like I first started re reviewing the manga of My Hero Academia, I remember making a Fury video talking about how Bakugo might become a villain, and obviously that's not the case, especially with this episode. So, just, it's good stuff. How Horikoshi twists, you know, certain cliches, or he, you know, he keeps true to character development and characterization and doesn't try to retcon things and just make it feel horrible. Bakugo in that situation, just because he's standing up to the villains does not automatically mean he's gonna win. And at the same time, though, we also gotta remember that even though he wants to be like All Might, at this time he's still not. And... You can see by his body, like, like the way he expresses himself, especially in that scene, that he is very scared. You, you can just see by the way the voice actor portrays his voice, but also just the way his character is drawn, that he is frightened. He is frightened, but at the same time, he is standing ground, standing his ground to face these opponents. Let's talk about the situation with Ida, because that correlates with what Bakugo was going through in this episode. For instance, characterization and character development. Now, I briefly talked about this in my previous episode review of My Hero Academia, saying the reason why Ida seems to be such a, you know, hard-headed, like he doesn't want to allow them to go or he's completely against them, is not because he wants to be a jerk for the sake of being a jerk. It's the fact that if he didn't do that, 
it meant he learned nothing. That, that's kind of what it means. And so Ida's presence right now, it makes logical sense. What he's doing right now in this episode, talking to, you know, Izuku, talking to Kurishima, talking to Todoroki, Momo, and all of them, just, you know, talking about how that, you know, they need to stay in line. They shouldn't be doing things that, you know, would make the school look even worse than it already is. And that shows his character development. He has learned a lot from his previous experience with Stain. And when he punches Izuku in the face, oh my god, that was probably one of the most emotional moments of the episode and probably of season three. <laughs> And it really caught me by surprise of how well executed that was. Like, I mean, I know My Hero Academia Season 3 and Season 2 and Season 1 and all that. I know that they've been pretty well done. Like, the, the adaptation-wise, it's just been quality. But that scene had so much more life into it. Not just because of the animation, but the voice acting of Ida in that moment when he was yelling at Izuku. And he just straight up punched this man. Like, he was out of nowhere. Like, this man's getting angry. And when Izuku's trying to walk up to him, he's like, BAM! Right in the face. You're like, oh my god. Like, you didn't even really see it coming by the way way it was done, you're just like, I mean, it makes sense, too. It's not like he was out of line. I mean, he did apologize for it after that scene, but it just shows how this man is so determined to make sure they don't make the same mistake that he made, and I love the little nod to how he's like, you know, of all people to do something like this, why does it have to be you guys? Why, why does it have to be you, Todoroki? Why does it have to be you, Izuku? And you see how the screen just pans on these two characters, which I think is brilliant, by the way, because it shows how difficult this is for Ida. I mean, he is still here right now and alive and able to be a hero because of Todoroki and Izuku. They, they saved him. They put him back on the path of justice and he's like, of all people, to do something like this, why would it have to be you two? Why do I have to sit here and stand up to you two and be against what you're wanting to do? And that right there, that really hurt him. You can see he was truly hurt by having to stop them doing what they wanted to do, but at the same time, he was staying true to what he learned from them. And so, in that moment when Ida punched Izuku and all that in the face, and you just see how he acted, it was basically him saying, look, you put me back straight. You got me to, on the right path not to do something crazy or die. I'm gonna do the same for you guys. I'm not gonna let you just go out there and die. So, great stuff. I think that was probably one of the best moments of the episode, just by the way that was done, animation-wise, and voice acting. Voice acting was truly the best part about that scene. Even though Ida talked to him, they still want to save Bakugo, but at the same time, there's a lot of complications with it. For instance, if they were to go actively fight villains, the League of Villains and all that, then they are breaking the law. We already know how the law is for My Hero Academia. If you don't have a license to be a hero, or you're not a proper, like, pro hero or whatever, you cannot save people. If you do, you're breaking the law. It's kind of like saying, hey, you know, I'm gonna go be a police officer, do police work, even though I'm not a police officer. That's the equivalent of what's going on here. They're heroes in training, not heroes. And so that was why it was such a big issue for why Aizawa was telling everybody, like, hey, look, you could defend yourself, and you could fight back and all that if you're attacked. That was why it was such a big deal, because, you know, they normally shouldn't have to do that. They can't do that. It's against the law. And that's why Aizawa took a lot of, you know, backlash from everybody because he knew that if he didn't say that, they were probably going to die. But normal circumstances, they wouldn't because it's just not allowed in the law and society of My Hero Academia's verse. So... That basically, what they need to realize is that they try to attacking the villains, get in a fight, they automatically break the law, and they're no better than villains. Th there you go. And so they come up with a way to kind of objectively, like, bend the law in a way. Like, they're, they're bending the law to where it's not necessarily legal, but it's not illegal as well. And that's kind of what they're doing. They're wanting to just go and grab Bakugo and get away. No fights or anything, just completely unaware, under the radar, nobody knows, just grabs Bakugo and runs. Th th that's what they want to do. And it sounds very illogical, which Momo does mention in the episode. She's like, obviously by the situation, not able to think, you know, think rationally or objectively at all. She's like, they clearly don't understand. So she's like, the only reason why I'm coming here is not because I want to go save Bakugo and put everybody at risk or whatever. It's because once they see the situation, they'll probably give up. That's what Momo is assuming, which we know for a fact, Izuku of all characters isn't like that, especially seeing Kurishima as well demonstrate how much he cares about Bakugo and Mitoroki as well. Just when you look at these characters, obviously, if something does happen, they're not going to stop. They're going to do whatever they can in their power to get back Bakugo. And Ida, even though we know for a fact he would probably stand in their way and try to put them back on the path, 
Yeah, that's not going to stop Izuku. We've already seen what Izuku will do to save an individual. I mean, look at his arms. Perfect example to how far he would push himself to save someone if they need to be saved. That's just what it means to Izuku to be a hero. He's a madman in a way. The costumes, which... You know, I love that scene. I mean, it's not really a big moment, so to say. Like, it's not that important, I want to be honest here. But just seeing how Izuku, how he d looked at this delinquent and all that, and just yelling real loudly to, you know, how Kurishima looked, to Ida looked, and how he acted like a pervy. He's like, oh, that lady's got a big rack on her chest. I'm like, yo, what? Like, yo! Like, I completely forgot about that, which made me laugh. And then Momo as well, just getting all fancy and happy. I'm just like, this type of stuff, I, I like it. I mean, I know not everybody's going to care about the comedy moments and stuff like that, but just seeing these characters trying to be in a disguise and just fit in amongst the crowd, they actually stand more out than they did dressed as regular students. But it does make sense why they went in disguises, because, you know, the League of Villains know how they look, so they need to hide themselves or they will be found. Momo gives an explanation of why she just did not make them clothing, which I think is a nice way to clarify why Momo won't be used as a plot device for certain things in the future. For instance, she could have easily made them all clothing, okay? Because of how her quirk works creation, she could have made them all clothing, disguises, and stuff like that, and then they could have, you know, been whatever they want to try to save Bakugo. But the reason why she didn't is because of her morals and her character in general. Number one, she states that if she was to create clothing or whatever, obviously, it would ruin the system and the economy and all that, because, like, it's like this. If there's some rare clothing that's worth, like, a thousand dollars, okay, I wouldn't buy a shirt for a thousand dollars, I want to be honest here, but, uh, or any type of clothing. But, I mean, let's say something's a thousand dollars, she could potentially make that, as she understood it and how, what it was made of and all that, she could make that with her creation ability, and then she could make multiple copies and sell them, let's say, on eBay, Amazon, or whatever, make up her own shop, and she would effectively ruin the value of that clothing. And that's what she was basically saying. If I was to use anything with my quirk and create anything I wanted and then sell it, whatever, it would ruin the economy. And she doesn't want to do that. She, she thinks that's morally wrong, which that's a really honorable thing to think about. But at the same time, though, we know for a fact it's not just that. It's not just the reason she wants to be morally correct or she doesn't want to ruin the economy. It's also because she wanted to go in the store. It's even stated by the characters that you just wanted to go in the store, didn't you? You just wanted to see what was inside. And so Momo, even though she is a rich girl and most likely she could have anything she wants or whatever, she wanted to see inside that store and that was one of the reasons to why she didn't make them clothing in the first place. So you could kind of say it's 50-50. For instance, 50% was that she didn't want to ruin the economy and the other side of it was that she just wanted to see inside the store and see how, what clothing they had to offer. The operation taking place behind the scenes, behind what was going on in the forefront with Izuku and the entire group. So it's very clear that all of the heroes or top heroes are being called into active duty. They are being called on an operation. And it's very clear, if you could put point A and point B together, that it has something to do with the League of Villains and Bakugo. Because, I mean... Last episode, we had it to where All Might, he got notification that, you know, they have a potential lead on the League of Villains and how to find them, and then all of a sudden, you see all of these professional heroes being called in Endeavor, Mount Lady, Kamui, you know, Edgeshot, Best Genist, I mean, you, you see all of these characters popping into the series and all that, and they're like, you know, we, we gotta work together, and you see this lineup for them in the episode, so you know things are about to get real serious. And even in that moment, though, there was a really nice little tidbit of narration that kind of amplifies the fact of how important this event, whatever's going to go down, how insane it's going to be. Because the narration from Izuku, he states, you remember after the USJ attack? After the USJ attack, I said there was going to be a major incident. This is that incident, which basically states that whatever is about to happen is going to hold a lot of weight for Hero Society. It's going to be something extremely important. Something is about to go down. I will say as a manga reader, that's definitely no exaggeration by any means. Holy crap. I, I, I'm, I'm not just saying that. It's As a manga reader, that's definitely uh, proper analysis on the situation by Izuku. Let's talk about the fact in this episode, Izuku's damage is very severe. Now, any of you that potentially thought that Izuku's damage to his arms would not be a very important detail for the series, here you go. This episode is a perfect example of what Izuku did against Muscular, pushed his body, 
way too far. Now, I know many of you are going to say, but Chibi, 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 Chibi. They said three times all. If he uses it two to three times, his arms are gone. So, according to Shonen logic, he's going to be able to use it two times, maybe three times, and then the fourth is going to break his body, but that'll be at the end of the series, and it'll be like some form of cure or something. I know many would say that, and honestly, I can understand why. There, there's a lot of stories out there, not just Shonen, but a lot of stories that do that. But, as a manga reader, I just want to reassure you, I, I, I know it might be a teeny little bit spoiler, but I want to reassure you that... This is very important for Izuku. What he did to his body is something that affects his character considerably. And this is definitely a part of the story to where there is some drastic changes that go down. So I just want to say, do not worry. This is not something that's just going to, you know, be written off and just swept away. It's not. It's, it's incredibly important. It's a big aspect of the story because it's proven already multiple times throughout the story that Izuku, he breaks himself too often. We saw him break his arms and hands and all that in the beginning of the series when he was just doing a training course trying to get into UA. And then we saw what he did against, you know, Todoroki and all that. We, we know this man has a habit of breaking his bones like paper mache. And seeing now the extensive damage he received in this fight with Muscular, it just really gives Izuku a reality check of what is happening to his body. And it's kind of like this. If Izuku continues to push himself and continues to fight, he is not going to be able to be a hero. See, if he loses his arms, how is he going to be able to fight? And so, that's the thing. He needs to know how to control his quirk and calm down and not destroy his body. That's a very big problem. Now, I'm not saying what Izuku did was wrong. I'm not saying that he shouldn't have went all out to stop Muscular. Muscular, he required that amount of strength. Izuku had to break his body just to stop Muscular. That just, it really speaks a lot about Muscular as a character and how insane he was. In a lot of ways, he may not be like the final boss material, but he's definitely near like the end of the, like, part of the series, at least for that segment when Izuku finally achieves 100%. That really speaks a lot about Muscular, how high level he was as a villain, and that honestly, if Izuku did not take him down like he did, most likely something could have been a lot worse to happen by the League of Villains, the Vanguard, all that. What they did to everybody at UA, it probably would have been a lot worse. Not just Kota dying, or Izuku dying, but a lot of people might have died just because of how Muscular is as a character. So, speaks a lot. Izuku did the right thing, but at the same time, his actions have caused negative repercussions to where it's going to be with him for the rest of his life. Now, I do want to say something that his damage, what's wrong with it, why his body is so messed up now, is because he hurt his ligaments. His ligaments are deteriorating, and it's very important for any human body to make sure your ligaments are fine, and his ligaments are not in any good condition whatsoever. His bones always broke like firecrackers, according to the doctor, which that's just savage to think about, and then his muscles tearing and stuff, but his ligaments also getting damaged is something that is truly the terrifying part about this, because the reason why they're damaged is because he went past his body's limits. See, I don't know how many of you know this, but I've heard this a few times even before My Hero Academia, that the human body, or the brain, it has a limiter. We have a limiter on how much strength we can exert. He went past the locks inside of his brain to be able to save Kota. It's kind of like this. There's a couple stories you hear on the news to where, like, man saves child by picking up four or five people at once or something. I'm not saying that there's a story like that, but I have seen stories where people have this superhuman strength when they're in desperate need, when their life is in danger or someone else's life is in danger. They do these incredible things. And that's what Izuku did, which goes with what he did with 100 per, uh, 1 million, one for all, and all that. So that's kind of what that scene was for. Well, as we already know, it was a battle cry. The reason why Izuku did 1 million percent and all that, it was just a battle cry to hype himself up. But this, this dialogue correlates with that. It correlates with the fact that Izuku, he just exerted himself, you know, a lot of adrenaline, hyper adrenaline and all that, and the man just went in, no care about his body, just to save Kota. It just shows what emotions were really swollen up with inside of him when he broke his body, which also goes along with how he didn't feel any pain once Muscular was down on the ground. So... Yeah, it's already one thing that his body normally can't take the power of, you know, one for all, but it's even more that he exerted past his body's normal limits, like, the limits that should be completely locked off, he went that far, and that he, in a lot of ways, he surpassed 100%. Even though he didn't do one million percent, let's say, one for all, and all that with a punch, let's say he did around maybe 105%. Like, he went past the normal limit of the human body, okay? 
and that's kind of why his body is so damaged. I guess the one big thing we could talk about is the media coverage of UA and what is happening to our heroes, eyes one all of them, the principal. So, we already know, thanks to what happened with the League of Villains, what they did to UA, it, it caused irreversible damage. The public's viewpoint on the Hero Society or UA or Hero Schools is very negative right now. It's reached an all-time low. And we even see how low it's gotten when Izuku's mom straight up says, do you have to go to UA? That really concretes how bad it is right now. Of all people, someone that has been so supportive of Izuku since an early age, straight up asked Izuku, do, does it have to be UA? Do you have to go to UA? And like I said, speaks a lot. Because this is a woman that had to deal with her son that did not have a quirk, and he was heartbroken. And you just imagine being the parent of a son that wanted to be like All Might, be a hero, even if he couldn't be the number one hero, or you didn't think he could, you at the very least want to support him, support his ideals. Ideal she had to watch her son have his dream just crushed like nothing, into little, fine little pieces. And eventually he got a quirk, which probably made her extremely happy. She's like, you got a quirk? You could be a hero? She, she probably was ecstatic. She was glad to see her son happy once again, being able to be what he loves. And she supported him dearly. And a lot of ways or theories you could throw out there for her appearance. Many have talked a lot of crap about Izuku's mom and her appearance and how she was this very skinny woman. And then when you see her in present time, she... She obviously put on a few pounds, and if you think about the entire situation with Izuku's life and hers, it's very apparent that most likely it has something to do with depression. For instance, Izuku's mom most likely was very depressed because Izuku didn't have his dream anymore, it was crushed, and she probably realized how much it affected him, she probably got upset, depressed, and then there you go gained a few pounds. Most likely, that's what you can do, the comparison between Izuku's mom's appearance and just seeing how she says to Izuku, trying to actually stop him from going to the place he's always wanted to, like, you know, does it have to be UA? It shows how bad it is for the hero society right now. So, yeah, that, that's kind of what that scene was trying to mean. But now, let's go one step further as well. I like Shigaraki's analysis on the public's opinion on the heroes. He's the villain, but at the same time, he was trying to defend the heroes, which is very funny when you think about it. He's like, what did the heroes do necessarily wrong? I mean, he's the villain. He's technically the reason why everything happened in the first place, but he's like, what did they do wrong in the first place? Yes, they, they did some slip-ups. Yes, they made mistakes. Yes, we got you, Bakugo, but in all honesty, it's not as bad as the public is making it. They're, they're overblowing it, which that's what a lot of news and media does in the first place in real life. And he's like, they just made a few mistakes. And th are they trying to say that heroes have to be perfect 100% of the time? Was it because of their job is tasked to save people that they just, because they failed, that they're automatically garbage? It, I, I love that entire combo with Shigaraki and basically how he's questioning why the public is just being so nasty to heroes. And it shows that he really is just confuddled. He's like, normally if they were a logical individual, this shouldn't happen, but for some reason it is. And once again, this goes along with his ideology, but also how he's using Stain's ideology to make himself look good or build up his reputation in the villain's side of things. So yeah, I thought that scene was really well executed because it just really shows that how Shigaraki feels about heroes in the first place, or how he knows this situation, it shouldn't have gotten this bad if people were logical human beings, but that's just how real life is in the first place. Even our real life is like that, so, yeah. But uh, that's pretty much about it when it comes to this week's episode of My Hero Academia, so let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Did you enjoy this week's episode? Did you hate this week's episode? Please be honest in the comments below, and I love you guys. Please be safe. Stay healthy. If you enjoy my content, please subscribe. If you like this video, please leave a like. Chibi out.